chapter this week? 20, chapter 20, that's right. You could be turning to the book of Esther. We're going to be in uh, that book today in chapter 20. I do want to give you a little a heads up, though, for next week. Next week, we're going to flip-flop the chapters that we're going to be on because of the way it hits for Christmas, okay? Uh, the scheduled tw- chapter 21 would be on Nehemiah rebuilding the walls. So we're going to flip that to the very next week. And this coming Sunday, being uh, right before Christmas, we're going to go to chapter 22, which is the birth of the king. So as you're reading ahead and preparing for next week, you could go to chapter 22, read it, and do the lesson there to be prepared for this coming Sunday. Uh, so close to Christmas, we just thought that would be a better way to do it. So I encourage you to be reading that in advance. As we go to our message today, we're going to have a word of prayer together. Let's pray. Father, we thank you again. What an honor and privilege it is to be able to come together as brothers and sisters in Christ and offer up praise and worship to you in song and coming around this table to remember the sacrifice and being able to give back a portion of what you've blessed us with. Uh, That's an act of worship too, Father, where we show that you come first in our lives. Thank you that we could do that, that you've made it possible for us to do that. And now, Father, we thank you for this time where we can be in your word, learning and growing, uh, becoming more like Jesus. And that we bring to you in his name now those needs of our church family, knowing that you hear and answer our prayers faithfully. And we just praise you and thank you in the name of Jesus. Amen. I'm going to be sharing a lot of different verses through the book of Esther today and a couple of other verses. So we're going to be putting a lot of them up on the screen so you can follow along. If you'll just, uh, I want to give you this warning again. You have three points on your outline. I'm not going to get to them to the very end, okay? I just don't want you to get all worried again that, that I'm, I'm going too long with the introduction. I'm doing it on purpose. And then we'll hit those three points right at the end, three lessons that we learned from the story. But first, I just want you to hear the story because it is such a wonderful, wonderful story Uh, of what God did through individuals who really were were born with uh, no notoriety at all, born under some, and lived under some hard circumstances, but God uses to do some really great things. And I hope that we can learn that as God's writing the story, He can do that with any of us, with all of us. Even as insignificant as we think we might be, with God's plan and purpose at work in our lives, as he's writing the story uh, and, and accomplishing the upper story purposes, he can use us in the lower story the way he's used the individuals we're going to be looking at in the story today, especially with Esther. Now, if you remember, if you were here last week, we talked about how uh, the, uh, the people in the southern kingdom had been taken captive into Babylon and how they... Uh, when, a Pers- when the Persians overtook the Babylonians and took control, they uh, allowed some of the Jews to go back to Jerusalem in that area. Uh, and they kept, went back with a purpose, remember, to rebuild the temple. And, of course, we, last week we saw how they struggled with that and all. Well, this week we're going to be looking at a time where uh, some of them have been allowed to go back. But we're looking at those who remained in Persia, in Babylon, that was now ruled by the Persians. Uh, They're still living there. Remember, they had been there for a long time. They had established homes and and jobs and and things like that there in in Babylon. So there are a lot of them that are still living there in Babylon at this time. And this week we're looking at the fact that we're at a time a little further along where Cyrus is not the king now. Now, King uh, Xerxes is in uh, control. He's ruling. And Xerxes is a king that uh, was not as favorable uh, in many ways to the Jews as Cyrus had been. Uh, And so the conditions were not great for the Jews at that time. Uh, But what we're going to look at today is how things got much worse for them before they got better. Uh, How they were were being put under a great threat. uh, And we're going to see how that happens. Now... Something interesting about the book of Esther that a lot of scholars bring up, and and I was reminded of it again preparing for this and reading through it again, is God's name is not mentioned anywhere in the book of Esther. But God is all through it. It's amazing how the hand of God is all through this story, that you can tell he's the one writing it, even though his name is not mentioned in the book at all. Uh, But we can see God at work. Uh, and that's something that I want us to really catch as we look at this story is sometimes even when we don't see God, don't forget that doesn't mean he's not there and that he's not at work just because we don't see it at the moment. Don't lose faith that he will keep his promise to never leave you or forsake you. Now, the main plot of this is God 
saving his chosen people Israel. Remember, he had had a plan, the upper story uh, included through the nation of Israel. He's going to send a savior for the whole world. Well, here the nation of Israel is in trouble. Uh, they're living in a foreign land, still a lot of them. They're still scattered and, and not uh, the people of God together as a nation anymore. And, and the story that God is writing to redeem his people, all of his people, needs to happen through this nation of Israel. So God has this plan of how he's going to restore them again in spite of their sin and their rebellion and be able to continue to use them for his purposes. Now Xerxes reigned in Persia from 485 B.C. to 465 B.C. His kingdom stretched all the way from India to the Mediterranean Sea. He is a very powerful king. He's controlling much of the known world at that time. Well, this guy is a party animal. He, he must have been, because during the third year of his reign, he decides to throw this great big party. Now, any of you been to, this is the Christmas season, a lot of work parties. Any of you been to a party recently? Raise your hand. Some of you have been, okay. Uh, was it a pretty big party for some of you? Anybody have a really big one, kind of big blowout kind of thing? Uh, I bet it didn't compare to this one. <laughs> this one, it's amazing. It wasn't just any party. This was a party that he threw to impress Okay. Now, some of you have been to parties like that. You know it's all about making that big impression, that wow factor that they want to have with the party. Well, this guy knew how to party. It lasted 180 days. <laughs> Woo! Six months of party. That's, that's, a wild, that's, that's crazy, isn't it? But he had the money. He had the resources. Uh, he didn't have any other job he had to go to. He's king, right? So he decides to party for six months, and he's inviting all these people to come, and he keeps the party going with new things happening all the time, and he gets to the end of the six months, 180 days, and he says, you know what? I don't think I'm ready to quit yet. Let's tack on one more week to the party. So he adds another week to the party schedule, and he lines up the events for that week, and he said, I just don't want to quit yet. And on the very last day, I want you to look in your Bibles at Esther chapter 1, beginning with verse 10. Now follow along with me. He's talking about this last week of the party. He says, on the seventh day, which really is the 187th day of the party, right? But on the seventh day of this last week that he tacked on, King Xerxes was high in spirits from wine. Yeah, that's the understatement of the century. Yeah. You party for six months, you're, you're going to be <laughs> you know, in the last week of the party here. He's, he's pretty well wasted there, okay? He's high in spirits from wine. And here's what he did. He commanded the seven eunuchs who served him to bring before him Queen Vashti wearing her royal crown. And here's the purpose behind it. In order to display her beauty to the people and nobles, for she was lovely to look at. Now, some scholars say that it is implied here that he asked her to come out only wearing the crown, nothing else. Now, we don't know that for sure because it's not that clear in the original text. But the fact is, he's just wanting to parade her around and show her off. And, and look, say, look at me, look what a beautiful queen I have. It was really all about him wanting to impress other people. And he was going to use her to do that. But it says, when the attendants delivered the king's command, Queen Vashti refused to come. Then the king became furious and burned with anger. Evidently, this Vashti had some convictions about things. And she was not about to allow this man in his drunken state to parade her around before him and his drunken friends. She just wasn't going to be treated that way. Now, some of you ladies need to learn that lesson. You are not an object to be paraded around that way. Okay? Okay. And when you allow people to do that and treat you that way, you are showing a lack of self-respect when you allow that to happen. You should never let yourself be used like that. So here, she's got enough conviction to refuse to come. But now you have to remember the culture that she's living in. In that culture, that was a terrible offense to the king. It, that they would have taken that to be a total lack of respect for the man and his authority in that case. Uh, and so it would have embarrassed him in front of his friends that he's been bragging about bringing her out there and parading her around, and then she refuses to come. So he feels like this really makes him look bad, and uh, he's very, very angry about it. So because 
uh, the, uh, probably a lot of the advisors were telling him this really makes you look bad and all that. Instead of handling this the right way, remember he's a drunk guy at this point and he's not thinking clearly. You know, a lot of people do some really stupid stuff when they're drunk. And we use that as if it excuses the stupid stuff that we did. Oh, well, you know, I was drunk, so no big deal, right? Yeah. Well, yeah, it is a big deal. You got yourself drunk, and then here you are making these decisions. You're the one that brought this about. But here he's, he's drunk, and he's, he's angry, and he says, well, instead of going to her and, and apologizing and explaining that he knew he had done the wrong thing, he vanishes her. He, 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 he gets her kicked out of the country to save face in front of his friends. After all, it's all about him, right? And he wants to save face in front of all of his friends. So he banishes her from the kingdom. So now the king has lost his queen. In his drunkenness, he makes a, a foolish decision, and now he has no queen. Well, four years pass, and Xerxes begins to realize the foolishness of his actions. Isn't that something? It took him four years to wake up and realize, uh-oh, maybe I did the wrong thing here. Maybe I didn't handle this very well. And he knows it doesn't look good for him and that culture not to have a queen. So he, he knows he needs to do something about that. So he has his advisors help him with this. And they come up with this great plan. They say, how about we have a beauty pageant throughout the whole kingdom? And the winner of the beauty pageant, the one chosen as the most beautiful one of all the women that are available, you could pick the very best one to be your queen. Now, that sounds like a plan that men would come up with, doesn't it? <laughs> I'll bet his advisors were saying, and just to help you out, we'll be judges. You know, ju just to help you out, king, we just want to do something for you because we really care about you. We will be judges in the, in the contest. Now, we don't have that detail, but, but I would imagine that they might do that. Well, I want you to follow along with me here. Esther chapter 2 and verse 7, we, we find some other characters in the story here. Mordecai had a cousin named Hadassah, whom he had brought up because she had neither father nor mother. So it's an orphan girl, okay? This young woman, who was also known as, what's her name? Esther, had a lovely figure and was beautiful. Mordecai had taken her as his own daughter when her father and mother died. So Mordecai was a relative of hers, and she, uh, he knew that she was an orphan now, and he did a good thing. He took her in to raise her. He was a lot older than her, and he knew that, that as family, you should help out family. So he took her in and raised this orphan. But he, re he recognized how beautiful she was, and he heard about this plan of what the king was doing, and he, he knew that she was a beautiful lady. Maybe this would be an opportunity for her to, uh, to have something better in her life. So, as it turns out, they were uh, recruiting these ladies to be in the pageant, and Esther gets recruited. She's beautiful, and everybody loves her. And, and they were looking not just at outer beauty either. They were looking at how they carried themselves and all that. And, and she, she stood out uh, among all the others, and they said, yes, we want you to be a part of this. So, she gets invited to the palace. Now, here's the thing about, uh, about this process that they went through. Before she was ever allowed to appear, to appear before the king, before any of those girls were able to be in the pageant and parade before the king, they had to go through 12 months of preparation. So the next time you have to wait on your wife to get ready, guys, I don't want to hear any complaining. <laughs> they don't take 12 months, right? They went through the, and I'm sure the training was all about beauty and about poise and all of that stuff that you would do to train. I mean, people today for beauty pageants, they go through training for that, and that's kind of what this is like. They bring them into the palace, and they go through this process of training and preparing for the pageant. And so she goes through that process, and everyone that's working with the pageant is impressed with Esther. They see she just stood out. Now, there were probably initially thousands of ladies being looked at here and considered for this, and Esther stands out even among all of those women. Esther 2.10, and it's very important, it tells us something there, that Esther had not revealed to anyone her nationality yet. Now, that's important to know. Mordecai had told her, don't tell anybody that you are a Jew. Now, I'm sure Mordecai had some reasons for that because he knew there was a little bit of a tension there still. There was still this, this uh, prejudice against the Jews in that country. He thought it would be better for her not to even say anything about that in this process. So she didn't tell her. Now, Mordecai did not know the whole story yet on how important that was going to be, that she didn't reveal that yet. But you'll pick up on it as we go through the rest of the story. 
Well, she's chosen out of thousands of beautiful young ladies to become the queen. They get married, and he declares it a national holiday. And he has no idea that she's Jewish because she hasn't told anybody yet that she's Jewish. Well, then uh, the Bible records for us uh, kind of a second storyline here. Remember, this is a story that God is writing. And a lot of times in a story, you've got a main plot and you've got a little secondary plot going on. Well, here's a, a little side note, it seems like, but it becomes very significant later on. But it's, but it's included in the story almost like a side note. Mordecai, remember, who had raised Esther, he's at the city gate and he overhears these two palace guards talking about a plot to kill the king. So he just over, you know how sometimes you overhear a conversation. He realized what was going on, what they were talking about. Now Esther's the queen now. That's the, the girl that he raised, the family member. So he sends word to Esther that he's heard this plot. He overheard what they were talking about. Esther goes to the palace guard and shares the information with them. And they investigate and find out that was the plot. And they have those people that were plotting against the king executed. But they wanted to know who was it that gave us this information that saved the king's life and they said it's Mordecai and so the king ordered that Mordecai's name be written down in their records to make sure that he was properly honored for what he had done that's an important side note here that Mordecai's name was written down there to be honored at some point when the king had that opportunity to honor him for saving his life the way he did he needed to be recognized for that well, sometime later, King Xerxes needs some help. The, the kingdom is, is going through some struggles, and he hires a man to help him named Haman. And Haman, elevate, and he gets elevated above all the other nobles. He's like the king's right-hand man. Haman has a hatred for the Jews. We don't know all the reasons for it, but we know that he, he was raised with this. He, he had gotten to this place where he had a real hatred for the Jews. And he decides that he, as prime minister, wants to make things really hard on the Jews. He just, he ridicules them all the time. He, he ridicules their God and their religion. Uh, he wants to make it as hard for them as he possibly can. And you know how often it is that when people are elevated to power, their true character comes out. Yeah, when they get us some authority and some power, you find out what their character really is. And Haman's true character became to really come out. And what came out was Haman was in love with himself. He really, it was all about Haman. Uh, he wanted nothing but to elevate himself, to have praise and honor. He even uh, had a, a, a law passed that when people passed by him on the street, they had to bow down to him. Every time they saw him, they had to bow down to him. Because they're just the commoners, right? And he's up here on this high palace level of authority. And so they all needed to bow down to him. And out of fear because of his position, and they knew how hard a man he was, people, everybody was bowing down to him, except this Mordecai guy. He doesn't bow down to Haman or any other man. You see, as a Jew, he knew that he was only supposed to bow the knee to God, the one true God. And this made Haman so mad that this guy, this Jew, would not bow down to him. He was infuriated over it. So he says in his mind, I've got to put Mordecai to death. I've got to get this guy killed for his lack of respect to me. And it doesn't, didn't stop there either. Look at Esther 3 and verse 6. He says, yet having learned who Mordecai's people were, in other words, he learned that Mordecai was a Jew, right? He scorned the idea of killing only Mordecai. Instead, Haman looked for a way to destroy all Mordecai's people, the Jews, throughout the whole kingdom of Xerxes. Haman was a Hitler before we even knew anything about Hitler. He decided that whole race of people needed to be wiped out. That they were an inferior race of people that needed to be removed from the face of the earth. It didn't start with Hitler, did it? started long before that where people would elevate themselves and think of them and their people as, as higher than others in the land. And that's the way Haman looked at the Jews. And he was looking for a way to go to King Xerxes and get this done so that he would get permission to wipe out all the Jews. So he had a lot of money, it seems. He was very wealthy in the position that he was in. So he went to the king and he said, I'll, I'll just pay you all kinds of large sums of money. Just give me permission to order that the Jews be exterminated. And Xerxes was not a man of great character, remember. And he listened to this and he said to Haman, Well, if you really think this needs to happen, I give you permission. 
but I don't need your money. I've got plenty of money. But if that's really what you want to do, okay, go ahead. So Haman comes up with this day that he sets where all the Jewish people are going to be killed, like the big extermination day where it's going to happen. And he goes one step further. He gets the king to place his signet ring upon it, upon this order, meaning that this is the way it's going to be. It's a law that the king has given him authority to establish. So he had the authority behind him to do what he was planning to do. Now, if you were a Jewish person and you began hearing this because word began to get out a little bit, then you would begin to think your God has forsaken you, wouldn't you? You would begin to think that God's forgotten all about us. We're all going to be exterminated. We're going to be wiped off the face of the earth. Now, God had made a promise to bless the world through these people. And now the threat is they're all going to be destroyed, all of them. So at the moment, it looks like to them God has forgotten about them. And, and we have an advantage of seeing how it all worked out. They didn't have that advantage of hindsight and seeing what God was doing. They couldn't see God at work at all in this. Like a lot of us in the middle of the struggles that we face. We just don't see God in it, do we? We don't see how in the world this could be something God is using for anything good at all. And so we lose our faith and our trust in God in the middle of the dark times. When in fact, God had not forgotten them. God was orchestrating and still writing this story, even with this threat in place, that was still part of what God was going to use to accomplish not only the upper story plan to bless the world through Israel, but the lower story plan of blessing his own people right then and there. God was at work in the middle of all of this. God's upper story is unveiling with the Jewish nation, with his followers. And in the lower story, this situation is incredibly bleak. But look at this in Esther chapter 3, verse 13. This is uh, an indication of the hatred that Haman had. Dispatches were sent by couriers to all the king's provinces with the order to, get this, destroy, kill, and annihilate all the Jews. Now, you really can't do all three of those. You only have to do one of them to do the job, right? But he kind of triples the order, right? Kill, destroy, annihilate all the Jews. He wants to make sure it's a certainty that he's going to kill all of them three times if he has to, to make sure the job is done. He says, young and old, women and children on a single day, the uh, 13th day of the 12th month, the month of Adar, uh, to plunder their goods. Now look at the next verse. And the king and Haman sat down to drink, but the city of Susa was bewildered. Now Mordecai hears about this plot before Esther does. And he begins to wear sackcloth and go into a time of mourning and prayer and bewilderment, wondering how God's going to use this. But he remembers, you know what? Esther is in a place of prominence, a place of some influence. God has allowed her through circumstances that looked like they weren't God at work at all to be in a position of some power and influence. And so he begins to plead with Esther. You've got an opportunity here. Yeah. Right? Everybody else saw it as gloom and doom. What did Mordecai see? Yeah. An opportunity for God to do something great. And he's put Esther in that place at that time with a plan and a purpose to use her life. This little orphan girl who had to be raised by other members of the family because her parents had died at her young age. And here she is, queen, who has influence with the king, who has the power to either destroy all of her people or save all of her people. So he pleads with her to go to the king and ask him to spare their lives. Well, she's scared, and rightfully so. You remember what happened to the last queen that didn't show the proper respect? Right? She got banished from the kingdom. She's not in a great position. She says back to Mordecai, well, you know what? This may not be very good timing because the, the king hasn't even summoned for me for a month now, for 30 days. He's not even asked for me to be in his presence at all. She thinks maybe he's, he's kind of done with her and off to the next one or something. He, she's worried that she doesn't have any real standing of influence or power here. Uh, that that the king would not be happy if she were to approach him. And in that culture, even the queen was not supposed to come before the king unless she was summoned to come and to his presence. And he, he hasn't summoned for her. He hasn't asked her to come. But Mordecai will not give up. 
he consists that she has an opportunity here, that he knows it's a risk. But he says to Esther in four, uh, chapter 4, verse 13, Do not think that because you are in the king's house, you alone of all the Jews will escape. For if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place. But you and your father's family will perish. And then I love this next statement. Listen to this. Who knows but that you have come to your royal position for such a time as this. For such a time as this. Could it be that God has actually been writing the details of this story all along? Could it be that God put her in that exact place at that exact time for this exact purpose? And friends, I want you to know something. You may not be a king or a queen, but I can assure you it is by no accident that you are in this place at this exact time on the world, in the world today. God has a plan and a purpose for every one of us too. And the Bible says that he's prepared in advance good works that he wants us to be doing with the time that we have here. He has, he has put you here for a purpose, for a reason, for his glory, for his honor, for his advancement of his cause, of the upper story, of redeeming the world back to him. Understand that you fit into the story that God is writing. Well, he says... Esther, you need to know this could be exactly why you're in this place at this time. God has orchestrated all of this for you to save his chosen people. And Esther's feeling this pressure unfolding in the plot. Does God want her to play that role? Is that exactly what God wants her to do? And Mordecai is laying it on the line and he's saying, now's the time, Esther. We need you at this moment. Haven't we all been there? We face times where God's wanting us to stand up for him. But it's hard. There's risk. And maybe at school when the other students are ridiculing you for your faith and God's watching to see, will you stand for me under those conditions? Maybe in the workplace. They're ridiculing that you actually take a stand to, to, to stand up for what the Bible says. It may be that people are ridiculing you because you really say, well, God defined marriage as between one man and one woman, and, and they're laughing at you and ridiculing you for taking that stand. But you know that's what the Bible says about marriage. Are people going to stand up for God today? Or are we going to let the pressure of the culture keep us from standing up? It may be that you've made marriage vows in your life, but the marriage isn't going well and you're being tempted. Somebody else is flirting around with you and you like the attention. Are you going to stand for God then and do the right thing? It may be that you know your friends are always wanting you to go out drinking and partying with them and you know you always, when you're drinking, you do stupid things. And are you willing to stand up and say, you know what, I just can't live like that anymore. I've got to make a change. You see, there's that pressure today, isn't there, in our culture? God's counting on us to take a stand for him. There's so many daily things we face where God is counting on us, wanting us to take that stand for him and do what's right. And that's the pressure Esther's facing. God is wanting me to take a stand for him, but it's risky. It's hard. The the consequences could be severe. If I do this and it doesn't work, what's going to happen to me then? And she has to decide, do I trust God enough to take the risk of standing for him, even when it looks like it could be a risky thing to do? God wants us to use the influence that he's given us to intercede for the lost people of this world, the same way he was wanting Esther to intercede for her people. So she sends back, she sends back this message in verse 16. Here's what I want you to do, Mordecai. Go gather together all the Jews who are in Susa and fast for me. Do not eat or drink for three days, night or day, and I and my attendants will fast as you do. When this is done, I will go to the king, even though it's against the law. And if I perish, I perish. Do you hear that, that courage? The courage, though, was in light of them taking time to fast and pray about this. You see, fasting and prayer always went together for them in that culture as the Jewish people. So she's saying, I want you to spend days fasting and praying before I even approach the king. I want to make sure... This is not done because I think it's something I ought to do or or done without the power or the influence of God involved in it. I want to do the right thing and I want God to be in this. 
So she asked for them to be fasting and praying. And she said, I'm going to be doing that too. And my servants are going to be doing that. And then I'll go to the king and ask that he spare us. So many times we try to stand in our own strength. And that's when we fail. That's when we fall. We know God's wanting us to take a stand for him. And we resolve that's what we're going to do. But we don't spend time praying about it. Preparing for it the way we need to. Going before God, seeking God in this, and how God could use us in the workplace, or how God could use us at that school. And we're trying to do it ourselves. And we're going to fall. We're going to fail when we do it in our own power. We must spend time with God and have His presence and power at work if we're going to be able to stand for Him in the culture that we face. I think we find out about Esther here that she's not just beautiful on the outside. She's beautiful on the inside. She's got a relationship where she knows God is the one that she needs to answer to above all. And even though she's feeling the pressure of knowing it could all go bad, she's saying, well, if I perish, I perish. I'm going to do the right thing here, even if I have to face negative consequences for it. What a courageous woman. We don't need more men and women of courage like that in our culture today. And we're going to need it more and more because our culture is turning more and more away from God and the things of God, and we're going to get ridiculed more, and we're going to get challenged more than we ever have before. We're going to need to have courage. We're going to need not to just look good on the outside. We're going to need to be strong on the inside to stand for him in this culture. You see, we got spoiled as Americans for the first 200 years of our country's existence. Our country supported everything we did as a church for almost 200 years, and they don't anymore. And they're not going to in the near future it looks like. So are we going to be a church courageous enough? You see, Christians in other parts of the world have had to be much more courageous than us for a long time. And cultures that don't support Christianity, that don't support their, their standing up for God at all. And countries where they're being imprisoned and tortured and sometimes killed for their faith. They've had to have a lot more courage than the American Christian has ever had to have. It's happening every day in other parts of the world. Are we going to have courage in the face of the opposition that we face? Well, praying and fasting went hand in hand, and they were praying and fasting, and she was preparing herself to go. She goes uninvited to King Xerxes. There's no way for us to know the fear she was feeling at the time, but she had to be just so scared, probably trembling. She finds a time that she thinks right, and she enters in. To the presence of the king uninvited and here was the signal that they would give in that culture if the king was willing to receive a person that came in to him he would hold out the scepter to say you can approach me now can you imagine i'm sure it didn't take very long but can you imagine how scary it was for that few moments before he held out that scepter to say you could come but she walks into his presence And he is immediately glad to see her. And he holds out the scepter and invites her to come in. I'm sure just so much weight of anxiety just fell off of her shoulders at that time. And the king says to her, he was pleased with her, and he asked her what she wants. And he says to her, listen to this. This is how prepared God had made all of this, how much preparation he had done. He says to her, ask for whatever you want. I'll give you up to half of my kingdom. Wow, you talk about a heart prepared. God had prepared this king to just open up to her and give her whatever she was asking for. Isn't that amazing? You see, she was so scared, but God had already been working upstream to get everything ready for this. Just like when you're scared in the middle of something you're facing. Remember, God's been at work upstream the whole time. You don't have to be so afraid of these things when you know God is working in them. He says, she says, well, you know what? What I really want is just, to, to, I want to have a banquet, me and you, and let's have Haman come for the banquet. Let's, let's the three of us get together for this banquet. She thought this would be a good time to, to talk to the king and ask for, for his favor. And so she throws this first, first banquet, and they have a good time. And, and, and then she just, for some reason, maybe she was prompted by God and his spirit. She said, the time's not right right now. She try, he tries to get her to ask for what she wants. She says, no, what I really want is one more, let's, tomorrow night, let's have another banquet. And then I'll give you my request. So the king has to be wondering, what in the world she got up her sleeve, right? What is she planning here? What is she about to ask for? 
But they have, and, and Haman's thinking, well, I love this. I'm getting to eat with the king and queen two nights in a row, right? He's thinking, I'm really important now, all right? I get to do this. So the king says, consider it done. See you at dinner. Now, the next 36-hour stretch, some amazing things are going to happen here. I just want to go through it really quickly. Remember, Mordecai is, he's heard about the plot. Haman hates Mordecai because he won't bow down to him. He's decided he wants Mordecai killed. And he decides he can't wait any longer. He wants Mordecai killed the day of the, that, that next banquet was going to take place. He, uh, the day after that, he says, I want Mordecai killed then, that very next day. And he says to his servants, go ahead and build the gallows and get them ready. 75 feet tall gallows. Build them out in my yard at the house. I'm going to do it there. So he got the servants working all night long into the next day, building the gallows that they're going to hang Mordecai on, okay, getting ready for it. He wants to make it a big show, make an example out of this guy that wouldn't show him the respect that he wanted. Well, the king couldn't sleep that night, and he was thinking about all the things, probably wondering what in the world she was going to ask for. So he wants some help getting to sleep. So he asked his uh, one of his attendants to come and read the minutes of all the king's annals, uh, annals that uh, had recorded all the meetings they'd had and everything. He says, I just want you to read for me the minutes of all those meetings. Now, to, to give you an idea, any of you uh, on a board somewhere, the minutes of a board meeting, if you were just to read those, you know, it's kind of like combining that and listening to sermons all at one time, right? <laughs> if you really need to get to sleep, you know, you just have that, okay? <laughs> Uh, you put that together. And so the king thinks, well, if you just start reading through this, I'll get sleepy and I'll doze off, right? But as they're reading through this, what comes up? They look at a few years earlier when there was a threat on the king's life and somebody gave them the word about what was happening and it saved his life. And he said, by the way, who was that guy? And they said, oh, that was Mordecai. Oh, just happened to read it that night, right? And be reminded that Mordecai had saved his life. He said, well, did we ever honor Mordecai? He said, no, we haven't, but we could do that tomorrow. He said, great, why don't we go ahead and honor Mordecai tomorrow? I love it. I love it. Well, the next morning is going to be the day of the second banquet, and they're getting everything ready for it, and the king's asked for Haman to come in. He says to Haman, and Haman doesn't know what his plan is. He says to Haman, what should the king do if he really wants to honor somebody in the kingdom? And Haman's thinking, oh, boy. The king wants to honor me. Here's what you ought to do. Get your best horse and have it all decorated up and have the guy ride around on the horse and have one of your servants leading the horse all through towns, announcing as loud as he can, this is the person that the king is honoring today. Everyone honor this person with the king. Just lead the parade in honor of this guy riding on the horse. And the king says, what a great idea. I want you to do that tomorrow for Mordecai, did you? <laughs> You see what God's writing the story. Isn't it amazing? So Haman, who hates Mordecai, Mordecai has never bowed down to him like he wanted him to. He's chosen to lead the horse with Mordecai on it. And he has to yell out loud through all the land, Hail to Mordecai, the one who saved the king. Let him be honored today by the king and all of his people. So he has to go around and do that. Well, the whole time he's still thinking, well, maybe tonight I can still get this done. Whew. So he's humiliated, but he goes through it because he knows he has to to keep his cover, you know. So he leads that parade, and Xerxes is happy that he was doing this for Mordecai. He thinks everything's good. Well, then they have this banquet, and in Esther chapter 7 and verse 3, this gal steps up to the plate, uh, and she has the courage. She says, if you found favor, if I found favor with you, your majesty, if it pleases you, grant me my life. This, my, this is my petition, and spare my people. This is my request, for I and my people have been sold to be destroyed, killed, and annihilated. So she goes on to tell him, uses the same language that Haman had used, right, and the order that he got the king to do. She says, I want you to spare me because I am one of those people. I want you to spare me and my people. See, she reveals that she is a Jew too. And the king realizes that not only has she been faithful in her role, but a Jew had saved his life a little bit earlier. And they were honoring him, remember, had just honored him. And he decides that's exactly what needs to happen. But he says, who is this that is wanting to kill you and all your people? And she says, with him sitting there, that vile Haman, he's the one. And the king is furious. He's so furious, the, the, uh, the writer uh, of the passage says that he gets up from the table and leaves his wine. That's how furious he was. Oh, 
this guy liked his wine. And he's so furious, he gets up and he leaves the wine on the table. He goes out in the courtyard. He's trying, steaming mad. He's trying to calm down and decide what he's going to do. And in the meantime, Haman is panicking. Oh, no, I, 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 I'm found out now, and I don't know what's going to happen. He knows Esther is the only one who can save him now. And so he goes to plead with Esther, but on the way to run over to plead for her to spare him, he trips over a rug, probably a Persian rug, and he trips over the rug. <laughs> Don't you think? And, and he trips on the road and he falls right onto Esther. So he's laying right on top of her right when the king comes back in. And the king says, I can't believe this. I leave for just a minute and here you are all over the queen. And we're here in the palace. I can't believe that. And he's ready to have Haman executed now. He just hates what Haman has done. So he says to his servants, put a veil over his face. You know what that means? You are about to be killed. They covered their faces. They put a hood over them when they made the pronouncement of death. And so they put this hood over Haman. Now, this is the really hilarious part. I want to close with this real quick before we get to those three points. Some of the attendants there that had heard and seen what had happened said, Well, you you know what, King Xerxes? On our way into work every day, we passed by Haman's house. (laughs) We passed by this morning. You know what we saw? He had gallows built out there, 70 foot high gallows. You know, he was planning to hang Mordecai there. Be a shame for that to go to waste. (laughs) Wouldn't it though, after all that work? Mordecai gets hung on his own gallows in his own yard. Yeah. You see, when God's writing the story, God gets the last word. No matter what plots there are against him and what he wants, you cannot, you cannot stop God's plan and purpose for his people. The turn of events was amazing. Can you say poetic justice? (laughs) I love it. Well, I want to close with these three observations as our praise team gets ready. What we can learn from this. Three observations in two minutes. Ready? Number one, look for opportunities with your life that God's given you. You never know when they're going to come. You never know what, what people are going to come through, what circumstances are going to, that God's going to use. Even the bad ones, that's the thing you've got to remember. Even the bad circumstances of your life, look for opportunities there because God can use those in great ways too. If you're looking and you're open and you're responsive to God and faithful even during the bad times, those can be opportunities. You call them problems, you call them challenges, and God says those are just opportunities for my power and my glory to be seen in a greater way. Number two, Prepare yourself with prayer and fasting. I I think fasting is a good practice too, the way the Jews did. We're not commanded to fast in the New Testament, but but it's still a good practice. It gets you to focus on your prayer and your relationship with God. And if you'll do that consistently, spend time with God daily, you'll be more prepared when the opportunities come, right? You see, you'll recognize them more. You'll be prepared to respond to them right when they happen. Sometimes we miss them because we're not prepared for them. We don't rise up and do the right thing because we didn't get ready ahead of time the third thing is this have the courage to speak up have the courage to speak up now don't do it in a mean hateful way was Esther respectful to the king absolutely the whole time even though the king was doing things totally opposed to God she still showed respect you know what we need to do as Christians we need to treat everybody with dignity and respect everybody I don't care where they came from, what they believe, how much they oppose us or oppose the things of God. We still need to treat them with dignity and respect because we'll get a lot more of a listening ear that way, won't we? If we can handle ourselves that way. But don't be so afraid to offend anybody that you won't speak up either. You do it with respect. You do it with honor. But you still speak up for your God, for your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. He's worth that, isn't he? Don't you think he deserves that from his people that we're willing to stand up for him? People ask me all the time, Randy, aren't you afraid to preach like you preach and take the stand that you take in the pulpit? I said, I I, I know people aren't going to like it. I know there's going to be resistance to it. But I'm more afraid of disappointing God than I am of disappointing men. And you need to be that way too. It doesn't need to just be up here from the pulpit. It needs to be in the workplace, in the marketplace, in the places of recreation. It needs to be there too. God's people need to be willing to speak up for God and the things of God. Matthew 10, 32, Jesus said, whoever acknowledges me before others, I will also acknowledge before my Father in heaven. In Esther 8, 16, it says, for the Jews, it was a time of happiness and joy and gladness and honor because 
an orphan girl was willing to speak up for her God. God can use you. If you're ready now to give him your life, the time and the opportunities and the challenges, give it all to him. Let him have it and do what only he can do with it. And you will see God at work in your life too. As we stand and sing, we invite you to come.